thanks for the introduction. I'd like to thank uh, National University and Kipo and Vishika and uh, everyone uh, for uh, this particular forum for this invitation. Actually, uh, the title I sent uh, was uh, The Nature of Indian Nationalism with particular reference to the current political situation. Um, if I would think of an alternative title, I think I might have called it uh, a Second Republic question mark. Um, the reference basically is that starting with 1848, uh, France began to mark transformative episodes in the history of their political system by giving each reworked republic a new number. So you have the First Republic and the Second Republic and the Third Republic. And I think the French are on to the Fifth Republic now. So the idea of a numbered republic uh, is a useful metaphor for exploring the possibility that the 2014 election, which saw an absolute majority for the BJP under the leadership of Narendra Modi, that it might mark a remaking, in a sense, of the Indian nation of the Republic in spirit, if not in letter. So what I'm going to do today is three things. If we want to understand whether or not 2014, the election of 2014, represents uh, the beginning, possibly, of a reconstitution of the Republic, I think uh, there are three broad questions or issues that we have to address. And I think first of all, and most importantly, I think you, we have to try and understand the nature of the nationalism that defined the first republic, so to speak. Of course, in India, we don't have the first and second republic. We are still, fortunately, the same republic we started out, out uh, with in 1950. But metaphorically, the first republic is republic, of course, brought into being by the constituent assembly between 47 and 50. And we need to understand the nationalism that actually constituted that assembly and that constitution. So we can measure the extent of the BJP's and possibly Narendra Modi's disagreement with the ideological underpinnings of that republic. So we are in a position to judge how far a republic remade in the image of the BJP might depart from the First Republic's principles and values. Uh, secondly, I think, supplementarily, we also have to uh, set the election of 2014 in some kind of uh, electoral historical context to try and see what it might actually signify and whether it is, in fact, a kind of watershed. And finally, we need to understand what the implications of what I'm going to call a majoritarian republic might, in fact, be. But first, the nationalism that constituted the first republic. Now, every definition of nationalism, it does many things, but every definition of nationalism seems to, at a minimum, suggest a growing feeling of sameness, a shared sense of oneness. Benedict Anderson, who wrote <coughs> in some ways, the most important book on nationalism in the last 30 years, in the early 1980s, um, gave us the idea of the imagined community, the way in which nations are neither natural nor arbitrary. Nations are imagined in different ways. But regardless of how they are imagined, they are invariably imagined to set out some vision of homogeneity, of a united self, the awareness of some sort of common identity, I think it would be fair to say, is central to any idea of nationalism. Now this common identity is typically, if you take the European instance, based on language. Though it can, it could also be supplemented by a shared sense of religious identity, possibly a more inchoate sense of a cultural identity as well. Regardless of whether a nation state is constituted by romantic nationalism, and by romantic nationalism I mean nationalism which basically is made up of ideas such as blood, spirit, essence, soil, this notion that you share some kind of mystical union with your fellow citizens simply because 
of the world in which we live. So regardless of whether the need for a nation state is based upon this idea of romantic nationalism or whether it's based upon a more civic sense of nationhood, a more rational republicanism based, shall we say, as in the French instance, on a notion of basically uh, a notion of anti-clericalism, a notion of civic fraternity, sameness remains the bedrock of the nation state. So I'm suggesting that regardless of whether you're France or whether you are, shall we say, Serbia, uh, there, are very, there are two very different notions of nationalism at play here. In the Serbian instance, you would have this sense of uh, being partly built upon the notion of the Orthodox Church and so on, whereas the French one would completely eschew any idea that a religious uh, fellow feeling uh, is something that constitutes nationalism, regardless of whether you belong to the one or the other. Nonetheless, there is a notion of sameness that underpins your identity. For example, in the French instance, this sameness is not so much defined in terms of what it ought to be, it's defined in terms of what it ought not to be. So for example, in, in a classroom in France, uh, the French go to what to Indianize seem like ridiculous lengths uh, to mandate kind of uniformity. So uh, you can't wear a hijab, you can't wear a crucifix that's too large, especially if you go to a, to a state school, uh, you can't wear a turban um, if you want to sign up for, say, uh, the French uniform force. But the notion, the idea that uh, there must be a kind of uniformity remains. But what is interesting about the Indian case is that I'm, I'm going to argue that it is an exceptional instance. The interesting thing about the Indian Republic is, which, and we assume that the Indian Republic is nation state. The interesting thing about it is that the Indian Republic and its nationalism traditionally hasn't invoked the idea of uniformity as its constitutive principle. Um, and this is not surprising because uh, if you look at the political mobilization that took place for 70 years before independence, and the constitution of the republic, it was dominated by a political party, the Indian National Congress, that spent all this time learning effective ways of representing the census diversity of India in a pluralist way. So the, the point I'm trying to make is that if we assimilate India into uh, nationalism as we understand it from Western templates, we are in danger of making a mistake, not because there's anything wrong with the West, or that this is some Orientalist project intended to demonstrate that uh, you know Indian nationalism is based upon you know can canonical Sanskrit literature or something. No, not not at all. I'm just suggesting that historically, the interesting thing about uh, the Indian Republic is that it's constituted on a nationalism of about 70 years standing, roughly between the end of the 19th century to the middle of the 20th century, which in a sense, is choose the idea of homogeneity and spends all its time trying to create what can only be described as a kind of zoological nationalism which tries to represent the diversity of India. Now, as you all know, the Congress is established in 1885, which is the high noon of the Raj, uh, just less than 30 years after the Great Rebellion of 1857. Now, in 1877, a conservative viceroy, Lord Lytton, calls it Darbar. And essentially, uh, what happens is that this Darbar consists of the Indian census made flesh. Remember that in 1871, the British began doing the senior censuses of India. So the British passion for sort of pigeonholing and labeling India has reached a kind of high watermark at this point. And the Darbar that Lipton calls in 1877 is almost an exhibition, if you will, a kind of museological exhibition of the diversity of Indian subject to which what the bars are called to illustrate subject to and imperial power. <clears throat> and in the Darbar of 1877, he arrays this extraordinary human diversity under one roof to demonstrate the power of the Raj. It was almost as if uh, you know, you rule the jungle, you assemble the species of that jungle in a kind of zoo to demonstrate the reach of the keepers of that zoo. There's a lovely story about uh, an early Indian nationalist, uh, Srinath Banerjee, 
from one of the early leaders of the Congress, who being so impressed by this Darbar that uh, he dreamt of an assembly of Indians similarly diverse, but brought together not to pledge loyalty or fealty, but to represent the nation. So he, he sort of inspired by the Darbar, thinking of how wonderful it would be to actually have a sabha like this, not for the purposes of demonstrating the strength of the Raj, but to demonstrate the possibility of an Indian nation. And of course, the first meeting of the Indian National Congress happens eight years later in 1885. Now, I'm sure this story is probably apocryphal and made up, but it's a lovely story because it captures an important aspect of the nationalism that is sponsored by the Congress. The way in which the Congress embraces the colonial tabulation of the Indian population, the census diversity of it, and then claims to represent India on those very terms. So the Congress in its early years, and this is what's really interesting about, uh, about Congress nationalism, and hence Indian nationalism. I say this not because I think the, Cong the Congress is the only political force in the late 19th century which has nationalist ideas or visions. Many do. We know, for example, that um, there is um, uh, a more Hindutvadi nationalism that has a lineage that's possibly not quite as old, but it's certainly uh, reasonably uh, old. There is a, a Muslim nationalism, if you will, um, manifested by, uh, by the Muslim League and its Pakistan movement. But the reason why I will, by default, talk about Congress nationalism, and I'm referring to Congress before 1947, by kind of default as Indian nationalism, is because I think we all agree here, whether we agree with it or not, it is the most important aspect of, uh, of Indian nationalism in the late 19th and uh, early 20th century, and certainly is the nationalism that is the principal anti-colonial uh, movement in the country. So what does the Congress do? The Congress in its early years bases its claim to speak for India on the diversity of its own membership. So what it's basically saying is that we are seeking out members from every religion, every caste, every community, every linguistic group. By doing this, the party in a peculiar way lays proprietary claim to India's diversity. It's kind of, it's sort of performative theater that here we are as a party, we have lots of different kinds of people here. And because we have lots of kind, different kinds of people here, uh, we, in a sense, are legitimately representative of this country. So if you look at the early history of the Congress from 1885 onwards, you'll find the Congress goes to extraordinary lengths uh, to find diverse people to become its presidents. So you know, you'll have a Bohra Muslim, you'll have a Hindu, you'll have a Bengali, you'll have a Maharashtra. Uh, the, the point is to sort of perform the diversity of India and thus demonstrate that you're a pluralist party. Now this self-conscious pluralism is not some uh, elaborately uh, premeditated ideological position. It's in a sense born out of weakness. What is the Congress in its early years? It's a meeting of anglophone elites that meets once a year. It has no organization. It has no mobilizational ability. It's patently not representative of India because clearly there's nobody who's low, lower class or lower caste in this organization. So how is, how is a party as unrepresentative as this, how does it have the hutzpah to actually argue that we are the Indian, and just in case you missed the point, national congress? The way it does it is, as I said, by saying that within our membership, we represent the diversity of Indian communities. <clears throat> it recognizes that its claim to speak for the nation is thin. It has no plebeian members, for example, and as I said, no organization. It passes a bunch of resolutions, and then nothing happens for the next year. So to argue the case, it, the Congress has two constituencies. One is the Raj. It has to persuade the Raj that it has a legitimate claim to speak for the nation. The other constituency, of course, is the Praja of the Raj the subject population of the Raj has to persuade, the larger task is to persuade them that it represents them. So what the Congress does is, it uses the metaphor of the human menagerie created by the census to propose, as I said, a zoological nationalism. It follows that if the Congress is to be a nationalist vessel, it has to be a kind of Noah's Ark. The Congress is essentially arguing that it has a right to speak for all Indians because it has two of every sort on board, sort of metaphorically two of every sort on board. 
Now, this is, as I said, um, a nationalism born of anxiety, uh, a self-consciousness that, look, we don't actually represent very much apart from ourselves. So this pluralism, this celebration of diversity, is as much a stratagem as an article of faith. I mean, what other claim could you make to suggest that you have a claim to speak for the nation? So what you're essentially saying is, if you think of diversity as a vertical thing, and not as a horizontal thing, because a horizontal conception of diversity would bring in the matter of class, and the Congress is practically an elite organization. So if you think of it vertically, there's a bunch of communities and castes joined together, which is, of course, how the colonial state sees it. So the Congress is actually appropriating a colonial conception of India and inverting it and trying to claim that it actually represents this pluralist diversity. So it begins as anxiety. It begins as something improvised, as something strategic. But I would argue that through long practice, between 1885 and 1947, it changes from being a stratagem into being a kind of lived reflex, which, is, which has enormously beneficial consequences for the nature of Indian nationalism. Now, this representative maneuver, this Noah's Ark nationalism, was one part of the Congress's nationalism. The other part, which in a sense completed the nationalist project, was the Congress's remarkable attempt to replace the customary content of nationalism with something else. So, if you look at if you look at uh, European history in the 19th century. And remember that Germany and Italy have only been unified about 15 years before the Congress comes into being. If you look at the great names at that time, you know, Garibaldi, Mazzini, Bismarck in the case of Germany, these are romantic nationalisms. These are nationalisms that invoke shared culture, shared languages, shared faiths, shared soil. What the Congress tries to do is it tries to replace the content of this kind of nationalism with secular grievance. And I'll try to explain what I mean by that. To put this another way, a national movement's claim to self-determination, because this is what all national movements do, they argue that, look, we have a right to self-determination because of some reason or the other. That reason normally is that we share something in common. Generally speaking, a national movement's claim to self-determination is based upon, naturally, a definition of the self in question. The dominant tendency in the Congress, however, is that it does everything it can possibly do to duck the task of defining an authentically national self. So the point I've tried to make, uh, at the risk of some repetition, is that the Congress does not invoke a homogenizing nation. In fact, it does the opposite. It stakes its claim to represent the nation on its claim to represent the diversity of the nation, which is a very eccentric claim to make in the context of late 19th century nationalism. The Congress realizes this very early on that the models of nationalism available from Europe, which basically, I mean, if you look at a map of Europe, and um, if you look at the countries, with the exception of, say, Russia and the East, most of them are small to medium-sized countries if we use the yardstick of India. These are relatively compact countries, even Germany, which is a substantial and large country by European standards. So the Congress learns early on that these homogenizing templates developed in Europe just don't fit the subcontinent. It's like it's like trying to stuff, you know, Bharat Mata into petticoats made for smaller European women. The Congress realizes that it needs a more expansive definition of what <coughs> nationalism might mean in India. So, for example, the language community. That seem to be the bedrock of European nationalisms. I mean, you just have to go through a list of, of names. Uh, Spain, Spanish, England, English, France, French. I mean, there seems to be a perfect fit between the name of the country and the linguistic community that actually constitutes it. Now, this clearly doesn't work in India because undivided India, I mean, divided India is diverse enough. Undivided India is dizzyingly diverse. It's more diverse, perhaps, even than Europe linguistically. Nor is the European habit of creating or inventing a shared history, something that works very well as far as nationalism in India is concerned. Because uh, the Congress recognizes, again, quite quickly, that if you try and concoct a genealogy for Indian nationalism, or a shared history for Indian nationalism, you rapidly run into trouble in one of 
the many groups that you hope to have involved. Which is not to say that congressmen don't try. Some congressmen do. So for example, uh, some nationalists, invariably Hindu, uh, see a kind of proto-nationalist progenitor in Shivaji, in his Maratha Empire, in his defiance of the Mughals, in his notion of Hindu Patpak Shahi. But clearly, these are notions that would be a hard sell to, for example, putatively a Muslim nationalist. So the Congress, looking at models of European nationalism, recognizes that neither homogeneity nor this, the idea of a shared history can adequately, in a sense, encompass India's diversity. So what does the Congress do? Given that it can't brew a nationalist essence for India, which defines, as I said, the self question, the Congress needs to put something in place. And what it does here is actually quite remarkable. There are a couple of books written in at the turn of the century, uh, the 19th and 20th, one by uh, Dalai Bhai the other by R.C. Dutt. And both these books are essentially economic polemics uh, or economistic polemics against colonial exploitation. Essentially, what both Naroji and Dutt are saying is that the colonial state systematically exploits India economically and its various peoples and its various classes simply by being there. So, for example, they argue that the reaching of India through the grain of wealth, these are all concepts that we are familiar with even through school history books, the idea of the grain of wealth, the idea of deindustrialization, the idea of very high uh, land revenue regime crippling Indian agriculture. All of these things, the fact that there aren't tariff barriers for Indian industries to allow them to grow uh, by sheltering them through European competition, all of these things are the stock in trade of the arguments that Naruji and Dutt actually make. So what what they're actually doing is, if Indian nationalism has to have grievance, and all nationalisms have to be a grievance, there has to be some shikar, otherwise you can't have a nationalism. There has to be a sense of injury, a sense of resentment. So instead of that sense of resentment and injury being cultural or religious, a sense of you know being colonized by the Austrians as far as the Italians are concerned, or some such historical brew, in place of all this, the Congress, led by intellectuals like Naroji and R.C. Dutt, placed the notion of economic grievance. So, Muslim villahas, Jat peasants, Bora traders, Parsi industrialists are all theoretically knit together by the fact that they are exploited in common by the colonial state. The reason this is interesting is that in this kind of economic nationalism, the Congress found a non-denominational way of being patriotic. So in a sense, you have grievances that don't, that don't impinge in an adverse way upon any community defined by culture or faith. So literally, in a sense, the Congress creates, if you will, a secular grievance. The reason I've spent so much time trying to define the nature of Indian nationalism or Congress nationalism, which I believe, in a sense, constituted our republic, is that it's important to make the argument about how eccentric and exceptional it was. Not eccentric in the sense of unreasonable, but eccentric in the sense that it departs from the template that we inherit as non-European peoples from a European precedent. It's important to say this because very often, uh, Congress nationalism, or this pluralistic nationalism that the Indian National Congress under Gandhi and Nehru and Patel and the rest pioneer. This pluralist nationalism is often, uh, by its hostile critics, uh, rendered as something alien, as something deracinated, as something that we, in fact, import from elsewhere, as something, therefore, not rooted, if you will, in the soil of India. Interestingly, of course, the reverse is true. Congress nationalism is born out of a particular contingent colonial circumstance. The fact that you're trying to be nationalist in an enormous subcontinent, which is extraordinarily diverse, under circumstances of direct colonial. So responding to this in a creative, original, part-theorized, part-improvised way, the Congress creates a genuinely original nationalism. And I would actually argue that the nationalism that is derivative of European models is, if you will, the Hindutvadi nationalism that supplies the BJP with its nationalist credentials. So pioneered by institutions like 
the Hindu Mahasabha, the RSS intellectuals like, you know, like Gulbakar or Bida Upadhyay. What you essentially have is here is a nationalism premised on the invocation of homogeneity typical of European nationalism. And the difference here basically is that the glue that's meant to hold the nation state together here is religion rather than language. This is in a sense a concession to the obviously diverse nature of the Indian subcontinent. Though we should remember that the predecessor of, uh, of the BJP, which is, which is the Bharatiya Jan Sangh, used to have in the 60s a slogan which went uh, Hindi, Hindu, Hindustan, which in a sense tries, as you can see, to combine the idea of a constitutive religion and a constitutive language in the same slogan. I mean, uh, there's a point where uh, the Bharati Jan Sangh and the RSS and the affiliates of these organizations feel so hostile to uh, the nationalism of Congress that uh, in remarkable contrast to their affinity with the Indian flag now, there's a point where they salute a saffron standard, a Bhagwat word. So we are talking here about two very differently conceived of nationalism. Now the BJP's nationalism is like many nationalisms, it's not unique in this, fundamentally majoritarian. Its arguments oscillate between a benign majoritarianism where minority populations are honored guests with complete political rights, to a more he hectoring Hindutvadi nationalism of sort specified by Goldwalker and lately, for example, by Subhmanyu Swami, which demands deference from the minority and threatens recalcitrant minorities with sanctions that include the withdrawal of political rights that allow for active citizenship. So, Swami, updating Goldwalker for 21st century rights, quote, implement the uniform civil code, make learning of Sanskrit and singing of the Vande Matra mandatory, declare India a Hindu rush in which non-Hindus can vote only if they proudly acknowledge that their ancestors were Hindus, rename India Hindustan as a nation of Hindus and those whose ancestors were Hindus, unquote. Now, those who say that Subhan Swami is an outlier within the BJP, it's worth pointing out that a year after he made the statement, he actually joined the BJP and since then appears regularly on television as the BJP spokesperson. And we have no disavowal of his views from, yeah, from, uh, from any responsible authority within the BJP. Now, benign or hectoring, this is a nationalism that believes as an article of faith that the Indian nation should be constituted by the culture of India's religious majority. It advises other nation states that successfully implement majoritarian agendas, like Sri Lanka and Israel. This is the majoritarian nationalist tradition that animates the RSS, the BJP, and the Rainbow. It differs so radically from the founding nationalism of the Republic that it isn't surprising that Narendra Modi's coming to power on the back of the absolute majority provokes misgivings about the nature of the Republic going forward. I just want to uh, quickly say a few wor words about why uh, the 2014 election was particularly significant. I think it's significant for, uh, for two reasons. One, in terms of purely an electoral arithmetic, uh, what we actually see here is uh, if you take um, if you take 1989 as a kind of base here, remember the BJP won two seats in. 1984, during that uh, landslide uh, blowout Congress had after uh, the assassination of Mr. Gandhi. If you take 1989 as a base here, and if you look at uh, the electoral history of India through the 90s and the 90s, uh, say 25 years, what you find is that the Congress in 1989 wins roughly uh, 40 or 41% of the vote, and uh, it doesn't actually get a majority despite that. This is partly because the Congress vote it tends to be much more dispersed and therefore less effectively used. And then you have a kind of slide downwards. And the Congress through the 90s plateaus out on a vote that's roughly a fourth of the electorate right through the 90s up to, in fact, 2014. The BJP, on the other hand, moves from a very low base to about a fifth of the vote right through the 90s, except uh, at the point where the NDA actually forms the government when the vote spikes up to roughly a fifth, uh, a fourth of the vote, which is about 25%. But if you look at the 90s and the, uh, the first decade of the century, uh, the BJP and the Congress are on plateaus. They, they, the Congress roughly has a fourth vote, the BJP roughly has a fifth vote. The difference, of course, is that this plateau for the BJP represents you no know, progress. For the Congress, it represents an extraordinary decline. And then in 2014, from, from uh, uh, 
a tiny 25% mark the Congress plummets sharply to 19%, and uh, the BJP, in a sense, goes up to 30%, or uh, give or take a percentage point. So clearly, um, this is this is an important and watershed election. Apart from an absolute majority, you see a circumstance in which the BJP penetrates uh, bastions of uh, Indian electoral politics where it has had no traction before. Uh, you have it, uh, I mean, who would have thought that there'd be a time when the BJP won as many seats as uh, the left front did in Bengal, or indeed as many as the DMK did in the south of India. But even more, in a sense, than the uh, rise of the BJP, this, uh, uh, this election was significant for uh, the decline of the Congress. Um, the Congress is reduced to a kind of zombie rump. In its heyday, the Congress's ideological pluralism is underwritten by electoral coalitions of diverse social communities. So, for example, in the Ganjati plain, it was that storied combination of Brahmins, Dalits, and Muslims. In Gujarat, which is now a stronghold of BJP, there was the acronym KHAM, which was Kshatriyas, Harijans, Adivasis, and Muslims. After the political earthquakes, however, uh, over Mandir and Mandal, these coalitions unravel, and the Congress has, of course, been in electoral decline for a while now. The BJP makes off with the upper castes, the Samajwadis, which with the OBCs, the BSP with the Dalits, and after the raising of the Babri Masjid, uh, on Narsim Rao's watch, the Muslim even seek other protectors. I think what these elections have done is that there's a point, even in its weakened state, where the Congress was seen as the grand old party, it was seen as a kind of pan-Indian party, and basically it depended uh, in recent times on the control of two big states, either uh, Maharashtra or Andhra Pradesh, and the fact that it was a contender in several other smaller ones, like MP, Jharkhand, Chhattisgarh, Assam, Rajasthan, Karnataka, Kerala, etc. Um, and the votes it received in these states was, had a great deal to do with its diminished but its still credible claim to being a pan-Indian party, India's sort of natural party of government. Now these elections, in a sense, have destroyed that credibility. In every state in North and West India, wherever it went head to head with the BJP, it was wiped out. Uh, but the point I want to come to is, uh, the interesting point here is that if you take the case of Andhra Pradesh, it represents a trend which tells us something about the Congress. If uh, the YSR Congress in, uh, in what is now seen Andhra, is essentially the Congress by a different name. And its defection from the Congress tells us why the Congress is in the position it is in. The Congress is a dynasty party. Now, an efficient dynasty party is a party where the dynasty actually wins elections. Because otherwise, nobody is likely to be invested in a dynasty party because the top job is never up for grabs. Mrs. Gandhi was a successful dynast. She won elections for her party. She won one posthumously in 1984, where uh, her son uh, won more than three-fourths of, of the seats. But we know that in recent times, the Congress has the problem of being a dynasty party where the dynast in question does not in fact win elections. So you have this situation that if you're a powerful provincial sutra of the Congress, if you're a powerful provincial chief minister of Congress, it makes much more sense for you to found your own political party because you have much more political leverage over the Congress than you would within it because within it you are, in a sense, responsible to the diktat of ten Janma. We see this trend beginning in 1998-1999, basically when you have the Trinamool Congress and uh, the National Congress Party walking out, and now you have you see it happening in Andhra Pradesh. So I think it's not just the Congress lost an election; the Congress demonstrated that it was terminally ill because the political structuring of the party allows neither for the provincial chieftain nor for access to the top job. So there's a sense in which the logical conclusion of the uh, politics in Congress, in the, within the Congress was laid bare or its vacancy was demonstrated by the election of 2014. Um, just two other quick points. One, there is a sense in which this election represents, in UP at any rate, a consolidation of what we might call the Hindu. It had been received wisdom through the 90s that the Mandal uh, dispensation had fractured the vote in North Indian states like UP and Bihar. 
so that it would be impossible to, to consolidate them on a platform of Hindutva. Well, at least in this election, that turned out to be spectacularly wrong. So it isn't unreasonable to speculate that at least for this moment, that perhaps in a more durable way, this represents in certain parts of India a consolidation of the Muslim vote, or at least a, a remarkable success on the part of the BJP in actually creating a circumstance where the caste arithmetic that had become the normal calculus of North Indian politics, in a sense, was held in suspension. Finally, I think we shouldn't underplay the fact that while it is true that uh, the BJP ran this election on a platform of aspiration, while it's true that the Gujarat model, in a sense, uh, is based upon notions like governance and economic growth, we should acknowledge that the Gujarat model has one other less publicized uh, feature, which is the disciplining of insubordinate minorities. This isn't, of course, the way in which it's normally put. Uh, all majoritarian parties phrase uh, their determination to put minorities in their place by using the passive-aggressive idiom of complaint. Thus, the gentle argument is Muslims are being pandered to, appeased, and this must stop. Given 2002, given the segregation and subordination of Muslims in Gujarat, the BJP clearly is the right party to stop doing this. I want to make I want to make the further point that the flip side of the consolidation of the Hindu vote is, in a sense, the marginalization of Muslims. There are some obvious facts that don't need to be reiterated. The fact that the BJP's uh, absolute majority rests on a broadly or entirely majoritarian membership. There are, in fact, no Muslims, for example, who are part of this uh, part of this majority. It's important also not to get stuck with figures alone. It's important to say that there is a sense in which. Um, uh, what we have, uh, what we have presently, is a political party that one uh, Indian uh, elections aren't broken down in any official way in terms of uh, of religion, which is a good thing. But uh, the CSDS is the nearest access we have to data about uh, about religious preferences, and we know from CSDS data that broadly speaking, uh, nine percent of Muslims and eight percent of Christians voted for BJP, which may or may not be an increase upon what the BJP got before, because I don't have uh, reliable numbers for those, but still represents a small percentage of these communities. Um, I think for all these reasons, it's not unreasonable. I mean, of course, it could be argued, and the BJP argues this, that sabka sal, sabka vikas, the notion that economic growth will lift everybody's votes, uh, and that there's a sense in which this is a non-discriminatory, genuinely uh, secular position a kind of inclusive position that doesn't pander to minorities. And this, this is not unreasonable. I mean, the BJP is entitled to make this argument. But I think it's important for us to say that given the BJP's history, given the present composition of the BJP's uh, ruling coalition, it's fair for us to say that there is some distance, there is some blue water between uh, the constitution, between the nationalism that constituted the first republic, so to speak, that made the Indian Republic, and the nationalism which sometimes emerges in the political rhetoric of the BJP, especially given the fact that it remains in its composition an almost exclusively Hindu party. But if I can take two more minutes, I just find myself. Um, I don't think, you know, uh, if you ask the large question, um, what will Mr. Modi do with his mandate? I think it's reasonable for the BJP and its supporters to ask that his critics wait upon events instead of assuming the worst. And they point out that the Modi's public pronouncements have been inclusive. And I don't want to go into the minutiae of what has and hasn't been said in three or four months since the election. There are many things that we could talk about. But none of them, uh, uh, but the shortcut coming in all of them is that we just haven't had enough time pass to know exactly what the BJP's agenda for governance actually is. I don't think. Uh, we're going to see uh, the BJP literally literally reconstituting the Indian Republic. I don't think Article 25 to 31 are in any danger. I don't think uh, Mr. Modi is going to give his critics the opportunity to say, I told you so in any obvious way. But I just want to say that we know that the BJP is a party that's ideologically majoritarian. And I think we don't have to speculate about what happens to a South Asian Republic if it adopts majoritarianism as its principal ideology. India's principal claim to our attention 
is that it is in a neighborhood of semi-failed states. You know, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, in terms of, in a neighborhood which is almost entirely made up of majoritarian states. And by majoritarian state, I mean a state where one community lays proprietary claim to the politics of that state, which claims that its nature defines the nature of that state. India hasn't done that. And I, and I think that is a considerable achievement. I'd also like to say that we also have in South Asia a cautionary tale. Perhaps the most evolved, the most civilized country in South Asia is Sri Lanka, in terms of its human development indicators, in terms of all around loveliness, in terms of the fact that it is, in every conceivable way, but one, an extraordinarily successful country, much more successful than its northern neighbor. But what is interesting is that this country, inside of 10 years of its formation as an independent state, chose in the late 1950s, under politicians like Solomon and Bandar Naidu, to adopt majoritarianism formally. Basically, what Sri Lanka did was, it first said that Sinhala would be the sole official language of that country, instead of Tamil and Sinhala and English. And then, 15 years later, it wrote a constitution which said that Buddhism would be given, as it put it, the foremost place in the politics of the nation. I just want to make the point, we all know what happened afterwards. We know that there was a civil war for 30 years. We know that more than 100,000 people died. We know that Sri Lanka as it exists today is not formally, but effectively a majoritarian state ruled by President Rajapakshi. And I think it is for all of us, or should be, a cautionary tale. A cautionary tale because it shows us what happens in an evolved, socially progressive state when it chooses to define itself as the belonging of one dominant community. And there's a reason for this. Within democratic functioning, what majoritarianism does is that it argues that the majority, however, it however it's defined, has a special organic link with the nature of the state. It defines that state in a way in which people who do not belong to the majority do not. Effectively, therefore, by implication, it creates two different kinds of citizenship. It creates a first-class citizen and a second-class citizen. Now, that second-class citizen could have every political right you want to give him. Israel, for example, would argue that its Arab citizens are allowed to vote. They have freedom of conscience, etc. But it's important for us to understand that while in an authoritarian state, citizenship doesn't matter that much because citizens don't actually have voice. Ironically, in democratic states, the idea of two kinds of citizenship, one, think of it like a tennis tournament. It's like saying, if you belong to the majority, you get a buy into the main round. If you belong to the minority, you have to pay a kind of qualifying tournament. There is a sense in which even the implicit suggestion that the connection that you have with the republic or the nation state is mediated by the grace or generosity of another community is invariably intolerable, intolerable in the context of electoral democracy. It invariably leads to violence of the worst possible kind. And I think if in 1947, India had been a mirror image of Pakistan, if it in fact been a Hindu state scaled up, say Sri Lanka scaled up, it would have also been a train wreck. To be a pluralist democracy, to be a pluralist nation state is not an act of generosity in India. It's an act of prudence. And it's an act of prudence that is foreshadowed by the founding fathers of the state. And we should think very carefully indeed before we choose to replace it with something else.